According to the most recent statistics released by the Scottish government, homicide cases recorded by the police dropped 15% in 2020 to 2021, compared to the year 2019 to 2020. This is reportedly the lowest number of recorded homicide cases since 1976. And yet, although crime is going down, Scotland still has dozens of unsolved cases in desperate need of answers. In today's episode, we'll be exploring four haunting, unsolved cases from Scotland. But first, I'd like to thank Purple Garden for sponsoring today's episode. Purple Garden is an online service that connects you to tarot, astrology, and psychic advisors who offer all sorts of services, from dream analysis to palm readings. We know that many people find it beneficial to speak to a medium or spiritual advisor for their life's problems. And Purple Garden makes it easy, as you can connect via email, text, or video. Each advisor is vetted and voted for, and has a brief recorded video message where they introduce themselves so you know who you'll be talking to and what their expertise is. Purple Garden has hundreds of advisors who are willing to help, not sugarcoating anything, but simply helping you with their services. Go to trypurplegarden.com forward slash coldcasedetective or click the link in the description to have your questions answered. As a new customer, you'll get your first $10 deposit matched when you use promo code COLDCASEDETECTIVE. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. The Templeton Woods Murders At around 8pm on March 20th, 1979, 18-year-old Carol Lannan, a mother of one and part-time sex worker, entered a red Ford Cortina in Exchange Street in Dundee. The following day, her nude body was discovered in Templeton Woods, five miles from where she was last seen alive. She had been strangled to death. At this point in time, police didn't have the luxury of forensic technology. They made door-to-door -door inquiries, public appeals for help, and spoke with local sex offenders looking for any clues. They discovered that the man whose car Carol entered into was described as being thin and pale, with short, dark hair, sideburns, and a mustache. They believed he was between 25 and 30 years old. An e-fit was made of the suspect, although at the time, it didn't yield any results. Meanwhile, men with red cars were extensively questioned. Two weeks after Carol's death, 80 miles away in Aberdeenshire, a young girl stumbled across clothing items and other personal belongings while walking near the banks of the River Don. The polo neck jumper, tights, and belt were identified as Carol's. Her handbag was also found, containing money and a child's family allowance book. Less than one year after Carol's murder, on February 11th, 1980, 20-year-old trainee nursery teacher Elizabeth McCabe was on a night out. Accompanied by her friends, she hit up some of the bars in the city center before heading to Teasers, a nightclub on Union Street. She was last seen entering a vehicle, believed to be a taxi, and was reported missing the next day. Two weeks later, on February 26th, her body was found in Templeton Woods. She was about 100 yards from where Carol's body had been left just 11 months earlier, and was also near naked and strangled. There were many similarities between the two women's cases. Both had been picked up in the city center, both had been stripped of their clothing and possessions, and then strangled to death. Additionally, they had both been tied up. Their belongings were found miles from where their bodies were left, as Elizabeth's possessions were later located in three different areas of Dundee. As the police began their investigation into Elizabeth's death, they wondered if they had a serial killer on their hands. Throughout the investigation, over 7,000 people were interviewed. Hotels, boarding houses, guest houses, and taxi offices were thoroughly examined, and more sex offenders, as well as cab drivers, were spoken with. But still, 
the police had no leads. They eventually concluded the women had been killed by two separate perpetrators. In 2021, the Daily Record reported that a man suspected of being involved in the crimes had been interviewed by the US police in 1979. The man, an American, died in 2016 at the age of 72, but his family had earlier reported him to their local authorities, noting that at the time of the crimes, he was visiting Dundee with his Scottish wife. He had been interviewed in 1979 in connection with a series of crimes in San Francisco, where an unidentified assailant was targeting women hiking in the area. He reportedly owned a nearby restaurant, and his relatives described him as a sociopath when it came to women, adding that, quote, he hated women and hated police. Despite his death, the man is still being investigated overseas, a relative of the unknown individual described him as having a military background and being extremely self-righteous, having been raised in a strict Catholic household. They noted that the man would have disapproved of sex workers and single mothers, and they theorized that he was an organized killer who stalked his victims. The relative has offered their DNA to police Scotland so they can search for familial links to the Dundee killings. As of yet, both cases remain unsolved. The Unknown Bairn On May 23, 1971, Ian Robertson was walking his dog along Tayport Beach, Fife, when he saw something odd in the sand. He assumed it was a doll, but looking closer, he realized it was a young boy, a toddler with no pulse. Ian called Fife police, who rushed to the scene. The boy was described as being between two and three years old, and it was initially believed that he had died from drowning in the River Tay before he washed up on the shore. It was estimated he'd been in the water for two to four months at the time of his discovery. The boy, dubbed the Unknown Bairn, was two feet and nine inches tall, wearing a short-sleeved shirt with a small pocket on the lower left side. The label read, Achilles size three. He also wore a cotton, fleece-lined, long-sleeved shirt patterned with blue rectangles and oval shapes. The post-mortem later ruled that the death was apparently due to drowning, but this later changed when the pathologist found he'd actually died of natural causes before ending up in the water. The little boy was buried in Tayport Cemetery on May 27th, four days after he was found, and locals would later pay for a headstone to be placed. Investigators scoured through missing persons reports, but found nothing to help them identify the little boy. Soon afterwards, a nationwide inquiry into his identity was started, and extensive searches were carried out. One theory was that he'd fallen overboard from one of the visiting boats, which stopped across the River Tay. Like with many Jane and John Doe cases, there has been little concrete evidence to go on in the years since. Despite this, speculation has been abundant. One popular theory at the time was that he was the son of a traveling family, groups who often set up camps in the local area. A traveler couple were believed to have been heard on a bus in Fife, discussing a child they had lost. The man had reportedly told the woman to keep quiet, saying, quote, shut up, you'll get us both in jail. The couple were identified and brought in for questioning by the police, but there was no evidence tying them to the little boy, so they were released. During their interview, they had barely spoken and only done so to explain that their child had been taken into care. A former detective, Bob Beveridge, who spent time working on the case, believes he knows the identity of the child, but he has refused to give his name, stating, quote, it would be a shame to have him identified now because you know something, every year and sometimes from all corners of the world, people will come to have a special service for the unknown bear on the anniversary. If he was identified, he would lose his fame. He has stated, however, that he believes the boy was the child of a traveling family, possibly the couple who were brought in to be interviewed. As they stayed in the cold, damp tents around that time of year, he theorized the boy died of pneumonia, and instead of dealing with the authorities, the family chose to put his body in the water. Similarly, in 2021, the BBC launched a podcast named The Cruelty, a child unclaimed, which covered the unknown Ben's case. They too believe they know the child's name after some thorough research, but have not made it public. They have also stated that the circumstances of his death are still unknown. 
Sandy Drummond. Ex-soldier Sandy Drummond was described as living a solitary and ordinary life. His family called him steady and dependable, but all that changed just days before his death. Sandy, a resident of Fife, quit his job without giving notice and withdrew a large chunk of his life savings from the bank. Surveillance footage showed him withdrawing hundreds of pounds and stuffing it into a hold all. The cash was later recovered in his home. He was found dead on June 24th, 1991, on a farm track a few hundred yards from the front door of his cottage in the hamlet of Boar Hills. Investigators initially believed the 33-year-old had died of natural causes due to a lack of visible injuries, but his post-mortem proved that he had been strangled to death. There is speculation that he was killed using a jujitsu stranglehold, which constricts key arteries and jugular veins and cuts off blood flow to the brain, and is described as a painful, slow death. This could explain why fingerprints or nail marks were absent on the skin of Sandy's neck. Locals were shocked by the violent crime, while Sandy's mother, Effie, was left devastated. She and Sandy's father had last seen him on the 23rd, the day before his death. Sandy had visited the pair for dinner and was due back again on the day his body was found. Effie knew that her son was troubled, but he refused to tell her what was wrong. She believed his problems began when he moved to a new department within the Guardbridge paper mill, where he had been employed since leaving the military. Although he would later move departments again, this time becoming a laborer, he remained worried and distant. Sandy was virtually unknown to the police. He had no criminal record, nor any skirmishes. He had no known enemies either, but the combination of his death and his strange behavior leading up to that day left them suspecting there was something more to the case. The 33-year-old resided with his brother and hadn't told him his intentions, mentioning only that he had just quit his job and might go away on his motorbike as he wanted a break. Another suspicious thing the police discovered was that an unknown car, described as an orange or red Morris Marina, had been parked outside his home in the days before his death. A witness then came forward and claimed they'd seen the 33-year-old running across a nearby field on the morning of the day of his death holding a blue sports bag, which has never been recovered. Furthermore, on the afternoon of the murder, a man with a blood-stained, bandaged hand was spotted catching a bus near the cottage. This man has never been identified, despite police appeals requesting that he come forward. A reconstruction of Sandy's last movements, broadcast on natural television, failed to propel the investigation forward. In 2016, Authorities announced that a case review was underway, and detectives later stated that they believed they had identified a suspect, but he was already deceased and unable to answer their questions. Sandy's case remains unsolved. His mother, Effie, passed away in 1996. His brother, Jimmy, stated, From the day Sandy died, it ran my mother's life. It probably killed her in the end. Tracy Waters. 11-year-old Tracy Waters was last seen on February 13th, 1983, when she left home to meet her friends at a Valentine's disco at her local youth club in the town of Johnstone, Renfrewshire. When she failed to return home that night, family members gathered to look for her. But when no trace of the little girl was found, the authorities were called to the scene. The following morning, at around 8 a.m., Tracy's body was discovered. She had been beaten and strangled. Her mother, Margaret, heard the announcement that a child's body had been found on the radio. Immediately, fear gripped her chest. Moments later, the police came to the door to tell her the horrific news for themselves. Tracy's remains had been dumped under a hedge in the back garden of a home on Shanks Crescent, and some of her clothing had been torn off. Investigators believe the perpetrator may have been disturbed and scared off before he could sexually assault Tracy. Looking back, Margaret believes it could have been herself or another family member who spooked them, as they had been looking out for the 11-year-old in the area at the time. Just weeks after Tracy's death, Margaret's brother, Adam McDermott, was charged with the killing. 77 days later, he was released due to a lack of evidence. Nobody else has been charged with the crime in the years since. Making matters worse is the fact that the police have admitted to contaminating and otherwise botching crucial evidence which could have tied the killer to the scene. Following McDermott's release, he was made a social pariah, as locals believed he was guilty of the crime. 
His sister, Margaret, noted that while he had not shown any signs of violence and had not gotten into trouble with the law before, she was not entirely convinced of his innocence. In 2001, at the age of 45, McDermott told his family he was going to collect his benefits, but never picked them up. He has not been seen since. He was carrying a large backpack at the time of his vanishing, and his sister stated in 2017, it's easy enough to disappear if you want to. She doesn't believe that he's dead, believing that someone, somewhere, knows something about his fate. While search parties did look for any trace of McDermott's, no sign of him was ever found. Detectives believe he took his own life after he left behind a note that reportedly indicated he was considering doing so. One individual who knew McDermott said the note expressed no remorse or guilt, just his thoughts at the time. The letter was dated the day before he vanished. To this day, it's unknown why he was suspected of the crime. Tracy's case is still unsolved. If you have any information about it, or any of the other cases mentioned in this video, you can contact Crime Stoppers at 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.